Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to another one of our Facebook Live um, presentations this evening. It's been uh, two weeks since we were last able to uh, get together, and welcome to all of you who have joined in uh, this evening for what's going to be, uh, a, a, as has been customary, I'll do a quick little update on the uh, programs, uh, some of the changes and revisions to some of the programs that people, uh, workers, and businesses are using here in Simcoe North and across the country and tonight we're uh, after we do those uh, brief updates um, we're going to swing over to talk a little bit about the uh, the, the now the change in the mode that we're in as we uh, sort of walk our way uh, and manage our way through this uh, health emergency as we're starting to see here in Ontario the reopening of our communities and our economy as we're seeing the daily numbers of uh, cases start to go downward. Of course, we all uh, tune in to see how the province uh, is signaling that. Uh, on Tuesday, we had the opening of the phase one of the reopening plan, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, what that uh, really means. So, and then we'll go to your questions. I always look forward to receiving your questions on any of the items that we talk about tonight, as well as any other things that are on your mind about uh, how the federal uh, and or even the provincial governments insofar as it uh, connects with the uh, federal uh, measures that are in place. Uh, happy to take your questions. And uh, Curtis is on the line here again. Curtis is my uh, executive assistant, and he's got a few updates uh, just to kind of re refresh uh, everyone's memory on how we uh, we do the questions. So, Curtis, go ahead. Thanks, Bruce. As Bruce was mentioning, we are going to do the Q&A at the end of the town hall, as with previous town halls. Um, if you have any questions throughout the broadcast, make sure to add them into the comment section of the stream. Um, we're going to ask that everybody keep their questions as brief as possible and make sure you're not including any personal information. We just want to make sure we're protecting your privacy. Um, and if we also do not get to your question before the end of the broadcast, we will follow up with you as soon as possible. And we'll go back to Bruce now. <laughs> Thanks very much, Curtis. And you may have seen there that Curtis is joining us from downtown Wabashine uh, tonight. So all three of us uh, that are myself and uh, Curtis and, and David who are on the call and managing things are in different parts of uh, Simcoe North. So uh, this is how our new technology is working and we are getting used to it, that's for sure. Vous pouvez poser vos questions en français ou en anglais. Uh, happy to receive your questions in French or English, and I'll do my best to uh, respond in the language, of course, that you pose them. And uh, towards the end, after we do questions, I'm just going to do a brief mention of a few other uh, topics that we, in addition to COVID-19, which, as you might imagine, is taking the, the by far the number of issues that we're dealing with uh, on, on, the, on the, as far as at the office and through emails and phone calls. Uh, but there are other issues that are coming in that uh, constituents are uh, raising with us as well. And I'll just do a brief mention of those. So let's get, uh, get to our up updates. Uh, first of all, on one of the big programs for businesses and workers, the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. Uh, we learned this week that that wage subsidy that was due to um, be finished, in other words, wouldn't extend beyond June 6th, has now been extended to August 29th. The, uh, the wage subsidy program is a really critical one here because it helps businesses and workers uh, get back into their usual uh, hours and work operations. But at the same time, it, it gives provides a subsidy to the business that they can then use to help uh, fund the wages that are necessary to get their businesses reopened. Uh, one of the key things, uh, as we, we see the multitude of people who are on the CERB, the uh, response, the emergency response benefit. I mentioned two weeks ago that that because upwards of 20,000 people in our riding of Simcoe North could be availing themselves of that important benefit. As they transition off CERB to potentially a wage subsidized job, as employers ask them to come back, there's a few things to keep in mind there. Uh, one is that if you are on CERB now and you get a call from your employer to come back to work, possibly under one of these wage subsidy uh, situations, 
those two programs can't overlap. You have to make sure that your CERB ends at a certain time and then your wage subsidy job would pick it up from there. So you and your employer would just have to compare notes to make sure that you're not doubling up on that benefit. Uh, at the same time, if you, um, you lost your job back in March uh, because the business was closed and now that business is ready to open up, um, you really do have an obligation as a worker to, to go back to work um, at that call. Uh, CERB, there's a general premise that uh, if you are available to work and it's available, then you should uh, pursue that and that would end your CERB commitment then, but of course you'd be back at work. So those are a few things to keep in mind as we uh, as we sort of make that transition from the CERB benefit to possibly a wage subsidized job and then eventually to when your business and your your job and livelihood is right back into full operation and then uh, we'll make our way out of those income support programs in the time ahead another big change was with the uh, canada emergency business account uh, a change just this uh, earlier this week as a matter of fact uh, the Prime Minister has mentioned that uh, they have changed the eligibility criteria for the SEBA loan. That's the $40,000 no interest loan uh, that's uh, repayable if you repay it by in full by the end of uh, December 2022, you get 25% of it back as a repayment bonus. So uh, you essentially just have to pay back $30,000 if you had the full $40,000 loan. Um, and that loan is used for fixed expenses for businesses. What they've done here is um, in response to a number of businesses that said the initial criteria was too restrictive, they're now allowing that if you're a proprietorship or if you pay your employees through dividends or if you have contract staff, you can use those calculations now to meet the eligibility to go on the SEBA loan. So that's a pretty key. I know that's going to help a lot of our businesses that initially were not able to access a SEBA because of those restrictions and uh, as i mentioned before you still have to have a uh, a 30 percent drop in in income business income in order to be eligible for that loan um, well moving on to uh, another fund that just opened up this week we had announced this uh, some time back uh, but now the all of the uh, parameters are in place to uh, to put that fund uh, in in place now for people so they can actually go and sign up for that and that's called the regional uh, relief and recovery fund uh, that's going to be essentially here in ontario managed through fed dev ontario and their branches of what's called community futures development corporations we have two of those here in Simcoe North, one in the North Simcoe end uh, for Midland, Penetanguishene, Tiny and Tay, the North Simcoe Community Futures, and in Aurelia, the Aurelia Area CDC. So both of those organizations will, uh, for businesses who were unable to access, for example, SEBA that we just talked about, or some of the other programs because of eligibility criteria, uh, the Community Futures Organizations is your stop to check and see if uh, you might be able to get something there. It would be in the line of a similar loan as to what is available through SEBA, up to $40,000 loan. Um, you will have had to show that you've applied for some of these other programs and have found that you are not eligible for them. And so if, if they've crossed that criteria off, you can go to the Community Futures and see if they can maybe get you connected there. So call your local CDC. Uh, I'm told with their program, in addition to uh, having applied and found not to be in, eligible for some of those other programs, um, you will have had to at least been in business before March 1st. So if you, even if you were a startup business in January or February, um, you'd still be able to uh, make a connection there for uh, the loans available through your CDC. Um, there are some other uh, small and medium-sized business uh, programs available through FedDev Ontario for uh, those that might be looking for loans or support over 40,000, and that would go directly to FedDev Ontario.
Now let's move to, uh, that's kind of wraps up some of the key updates. Now we know that uh, things are starting to change out there and we're now getting back to the reopening of our economy. And that's really good news. That's going to allow more people to get back to work. It's going to allow businesses that have essentially been shuttered uh, to at least get back to a point where they can uh, have work back to get their customers back, albeit with restrictions still in place. We understand that. But Ontario has really set out a three phase, a three step process, all of it uh, based on the uh, chief medical officer of health here in the province of Ontario, their recommendations to the government as to when the right time will be to, for example, transition from phase one to phase two, when more uh, non-essential businesses can open. And presumably, as we get towards phase three, um, the ability to have more gatherings of people more than five. Right now, we're limited to gatherings of no more than five. Um, but as we go up the notch in terms of the phases in front of us, um, the likelihood that the number of people in gatherings can likely increase. Um, the province is always very quick to remind us here that um, if things start to go uh, backwards in terms of seeing higher number of cases, for example, they may have to reimpose restrictions. So we all of us still have a duty to do our best to make sure the restrictions that are in place around uh, social distancing and washing our hands and taking advantage of uh, any uh, or making sure that when we're in the proximity of other people that uh, especially if you can't maintain social distancing that you're wearing a mask. So um, that's um, that's a key part of this uh, program going forward and I do think that uh, as all of us as we've done so far uh, here and certainly in this part of the province I think we've done a really good job at uh, flattening the curve and making sure that we haven't overwhelmed our healthcare uh, facilities. Now one of the key things as with reopening both workers and businesses will have to know what the rules are, what the guidelines are to make sure that you can run your business safely. And so the Ontario here again, and I'm pointing to the province of Ontario has some excellent resources for this. You can go to the Ontario Ministry of Labour um, Ontario site uh, that's called resources um, for the prevention of COVID-19 in the workplace. And that's a, that's a site right on the Ontario page where there's a, an excellent resource depending on what classification or what category of business you're in. Some really good advice there around what to follow to make sure that you're abiding by the rules that are necessary to keep both you, you and your employees and your customers safe. Um, and being aware that COVID-19 is, uh, is out there in the community and it can even be present in people who don't even have any symptoms. So we have to take all these precautions and that's what businesses will do as well. So have a visit to that uh, website. Uh, also locally here, the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit uh, has some excellent uh, resources available both in terms of uh, how to manage and use, for example, protective uh, equipment, personal protective equipment, the right methods for managing it uh, safely, the kind of uh, PPE that you might need in the workplace, uh, and also uh, some great resources on the Health Unit website for uh, all of the aspects of reopening your business. So I recommend those to you. Uh, all those, uh, again, very, very good, well thought out and very simple to, to go through and, and set up for your own business. One of the key uh, aspects of this reopening is the fact that as we heard from Ontario officials, they told us starting several weeks ago that the phase one opening was coming and it's on its way and soon and so get ready and be ready for when that opening comes. So I can't stress that enough. Um, the more you can use this time, if your business is not open now, um, use this time to get the get all of the PPE that you're needing, the uh, the, the guidelines, the, the rules, all the things. I'm sure that many business owners are doing this already, but it's just, a, just as a 
not a caution, but a suggestion, a recommendation to look at uh, getting some of that advance work done now so that when Ontario makes the call that, hey, we're at phase two and now a whole bunch of new businesses can open, you'll be ready to go and you, there'll be no delay because one of the assumptions in all of this is, is while your business may be on the list in one of these stages that can now reopen, you can't reopen unless you have all of the apparatus in place to allow that to be. So uh, get going on that uh, while the time is. And that sort of takes us to uh, another uh, area of uh, planning and, and organizing for your reopening, and that is the necessity of having uh, personal protective equipment. Um, each kind of business environment is going to need different kind of equipment. Um, you, There are excellent, uh, again, resources available to tell you what you need. And Ontario just this week uh, launched a new uh, PPE supplier directory. You can go right on that directory. There's a link even on the health unit uh, website. And how they have listed their uh, businesses all across the province that are providing the kind of equipment that is necessary. Also, if you're a business that does supply those kinds of um, be it uh, masks or gowns or uh, rubber gloves. I don't have to be rubber gloves, but protective gloves. Um, all of the, uh, the the things that you might need to help protect you, including things like sneeze guards or counter guards, uh, plexiglass positions and things of that nature that you need to equip your store or your workplace. Uh, go have a look there. And But if you supply those things, go on that site and make sure you get your business listed there because uh, that's a central uh, directory uh, that's for free uh, that you can make sure you're on the list. Um, I notice at this point there are I think only two organizations in our riding that are listed on that directory and uh, one of them being Blue Mountain Linens and the other being uh, Odyssey um, who are supplying some facets of PPE. Uh, we've also got up there for you a number of local suppliers here that are providing. In fact, even my office is getting in the process. We're not open yet for uh, customers to come in, but we're in the process of getting set up for that. Uh, but you can talk to people like First, uh, First for Safety in Midland, uh, I mentioned Blue Mountain Linens, uh, Swish Maintenance uh, has a Clean It store down in Barrie. Uh, all of these are, are not open to the public right now, but you can call in, get your order, uh, pay for it in advance on a credit card, and then arrange to go and pick it up at curbside. Uh, two of those listed there, I should mention, uh, both Templeton Windows uh, and Balm Beach uh, House of Glass over on the Midland side, they're doing, and they're the big business right now, helping stores get set up for Plexi glass uh, guards and that sort of thing. So that's kind of our update. Um, we've got, uh, you know, lots to think about here in terms of getting ready uh, for the next uh, steps as we uh, reopen the economy. So at this point, I'd like to uh, turn to questions and I'll just go to see what uh, Curtis has got here for me. So let's see. So we have a question from Tracy from uh, UBI Works that's asking, are we any closer to getting a universal uh, basic income? I guess that's what UBI, uh, I should have picked up on that actually, uh, but that's a, that's a great question. Tracy, uh, uh, and we may have even discussed this actually, I, there's of course no, there's no real policy discussions underway uh, officially, uh, either at the province or at the federal level uh, as to how in the sort of the in the in the wake of or in the recovery period after COVID-19, how some of the programs like CERB, for example, um, whether some facets of it will will continue after the recovery period. I think this, uh, to a great extent, the experience that governments and and taxpayers are and people across society are seeing is going to change the way people think about uh, these kinds of programs. So if there's, I think, issues around making sure that especially people who, through no fault of their own, are unable to participate in the, in the wage, the, the traditional wage economy, I think a case can be made for making sure that people can live in, in a, at a level of dignity and, and with the proper security um, that allows them to do so in a way that uh, we would all be uh, proud to see in our communities. So I, I think it's a discussion that still needs to be had, but no official, um, no official policy development on that area just yet. 
Um, Jay is asking, how come you have to have a payroll in order to qualify for SEBA? Well, actually, Jay, a, a key question there, you actually don't need to now. Uh, so the original rule was that you had to have at least $20,000 in payroll. So under these new rules, um, if you, even if you have no payroll per se, let's say you're a proprietorship and you all of the money that you get from your business essentially goes into your personal uh, income, um, you can, as long as you're, you can show that that's income being generated by your business, um, you will qualify for SEBA. Same thing if you, let's say you don't have payroll, but you use contract staff. You, you bring in your labor inputs in your business are through contract and not through a salary account, you will qualify for SEBA. And the same thing if you take your money out of the company in dividends. Dividend income will be considered eligible for SEBA. So I hope that uh, will clear that up. If you have any um, further uh, questions on that, give us a shout at the office, Jay, and we'd be happy to help you with that. Uh, Rob is looking for an update on the Trent Severn Waterway. You know, Rob, just this evening, I, I got a, an email uh, from, it was through our local Chamber of Commerce to say that uh, next week I've been invited to go on a call with some of the officials from the Trent Severn. At this point, their official position is that there is no uh, reopening, that it remains closed until further notice. Uh, you may have seen that some national parks are open for uh, day use only and so you know and in limited numbers so that's not what I would call a real opening of uh, Canada's uh, parks and historical sites just yet um, but uh, stand by and I think we'll see those opening up um, in, in the near future, as I think really much of that is going to be gauged on how Ontario uh, starts to get closer to its phase two. But I can't, uh, I don't want to say for a moment that I'm, I can predict, you know, how that decision making process is going to go. Uh, suffice to say, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly feed that kind of information up the line. Um, Question. So Jay's asking, curious to know if there has been talk about fishing lodges or camps that only get one season um, to open up to provincial clientele. Um, uh, yeah, good point here. Jay is making that a lot of our outdoor um, outdoor type tourism, be it fishing or eco lodges, um, more the kind of lodges that are more northern of, of north of us here as you get up into parts of northwestern and northeastern Ontario and fantastic fishing, hunting, all of those outdoor sports and resorts that are just great. But he's right, they do really depend on a lot of American tourists. And so in insofar as lodges per se are not uh, I don't are not going to be restricted from uh, overnight accommodation. I think that's something we would want to clarify. Um, they may not be able to have visitors come in from the U.S. Uh, and currently that U.S. restriction is in place until June 21st. Uh, whether it'll open up after June 21st will probably have a lot to do with how the U.S. is doing in terms of flattening the curve there on, uh, on this COVID-19. But um, we'll have to. Nothing, we can't say for certain when that uh, border is going to open. So I, I think in, so if uh, lodges are able to open, if they can tailor some of their products to uh, Southern Ontarians, and I would say generally, you know, tourism and travel businesses are going to be among, and food service businesses are going to be the most hardest hit in this uh, COVID-19. Um, health emergency and if more Canadians and Ontarians can travel if they once we're able to to travel in our own province that's going to be a real help to our home-based uh, businesses uh, home-based is not the right word there businesses that are situated here in Ontario or across Canada um, that'll be a, a huge help to our own entrepreneurs and business owners across the country um, Shona is asking if, uh, is looking for an update on the status of the Canada Summer Jobs Program. I'm, you know, Curtis is my expert on uh, Canada Summer Jobs. I'm going to ask him to see, Curtis, if you've got any updates on that. Uh, 
Yeah, so the uh, first wave of announcements was sent out on May 15th. Um, Service Canada is doing something a little different this year just because they did send out questionnaires to um, essentially gauge participation in the program. Obviously, some businesses may not be participating this year in light of COVID. Um, so they've been awaiting the questionnaires to be returned and then going through the questionnaires to make sure um, the people are still, organizations and businesses are still participating. If that is the case, then they will be sending out the announcements sort of in a, a weekly stage. So the second wave of, an, of announcements went out uh, today, actually. Um, so it looks like every week, uh, Service Canada will be sending out a waived announcement. So if you haven't heard anything on your application and you're concerned or you're looking to hire students, just reach out to the office and we can try following up with Service Canada on your behalf to see if we can figure out what's going on with your application. Thanks. Thanks very much, Curtis. And a great question, Shona. We'll keep keep an eye on that. We're literally, as Curtis said, right at the spot where those approvals are kind of coming in and bits and pieces. So happy to help you with that. Uh, Barb's asking, when will the additional OAS and GIS uh, be issued? So what Barb is referring to there, uh, about a week ago, the government announced, and yeah, as you may know, is we've had some um, questions about this very thing on our Facebook Live broadcast. Uh, people saying, well, how can we get some help for seniors as well? When will that be coming? Well, the government has, has listened to that uh, and heard from opposition and other MPs in the House about these issues. And well, albeit, um, you know, some will say that uh, seniors, um, they, if they were on a fixed income already, they you know may not have seen a, a change in their income situation just because of COVID-19. Well, that may be true, but I can tell you that there's many seniors in our community who are having a difficult time making ends meet, and they are certainly facing, in a lot of cases, higher costs and more difficult logistics with getting the very basic things that they need. So the government is going to be sending out an extra $300 uh, per person who's on old age security. And if you're on the guaranteed income supplement, it's an extra $200. When will that come? We don't have a set date on that, but we're expecting the end of this month or early June. You'll be seeing those checks and it'll likely arrive on the same check payment that you would normally get uh, in your monthly uh, check that comes in for old age security and guaranteed income supplement. Now, John is asking, um, he caught some of the uh, loan requirement with dividends. So where, where do you apply for that? So John, the SIBA is a, a loan that's actually managed through your regular lender. So wherever you do your banking, you know, one of the mainstream bankers, and I, I believe credit unions can do this as well. They've, they've been able to offer the SIBA product. But just talk to your lender. Um, what what has happened here is the government has uh, broadened the criteria for eligibility. So now when you go to your lender, you may even be getting something from your lender on this fairly soon. Um, we saw when SIBA first came out, um, lenders were sending emails out to their business customers saying, hey, you can come and get this SIBA uh, loan. And um, so that so I talk to your bank, and uh, once you get your business all set up there, you should be uh, ready to go. And a question: uh, Will masks be mandatory even for people who have difficulty breathing when wearing a mask? That's a really good question. Um, the mandatory use of masks. I think there was even some stuff on the news today about the you know recommendations around the use of uh, face masks. Uh, the basic principle is this: uh, this um, virus, coronavirus, is spread by the uh, droplets that are uh, emanating from you as you're breathing and talking and and so on. So they can come out of your mouth and nose. And by putting a mask on, you're basically you, well, I should say, you if you don't have any symptoms, it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have the virus. Even people who are, as they say, asymptomatic could are seen to have been uh, transferring this virus even before they develop symptoms. So wearing a mask is there to protect uh, the people around you from potentially getting the virus from yourself um, because you may not know if you have it. So I certainly recommend wearing it, especially in areas where you're going to be around other people. It's really to protect your, your colleagues in the community. 
Um, it's not to say that it doesn't afford some protection for you as well. Uh, but if you can't wear a mask uh, because of the breathing impediment, um, I'd certainly recommend, you know, avoiding being in places where there's other people, sticking to the uh, small gatherings of people, keeping to your own uh, circle of friends as much as you can, and just be aware that, you know, you don't want to be anywhere close where that kind of emanating droplets might be putting other people uh, in potential risk. So um, that's a probably a very long and you know distraught answer to that question. I wish it could be more clear, um, but certainly you're you're going to see the use of masks in the time ahead, uh, in the time ahead, much more uh, than we have seen in the past. And uh, I think we'll see masks as part of our lives actually um, as, until such time as we have a vaccine or some kind of treatment. Um, Barb asks, uh, does someone on a spousal allowance qualify for OAS? The answer is yes. If you're on the what's called the allowance, that's the a benefit that you get through. Uh, that's a GIS uh, payment. Um, I'm just going to check with Curtis. We haven't heard anything differently on that, Curtis. Uh, if you're on the allowance, that's a GIS type benefit. I'm going to assume that a, an allowance recipient would get this as well. I believe so as well. As long as you're qualifying for GIS um, and the GAINS program, then you should be eligible for the payment. Um, if that's a question you have and you're not entirely sure, we can reach out to Service Canada on your behalf. Um, so just reach out to our office. Um, we're open Monday through Friday, 9 to 4, and then we can can uh, follow up with Service Canada to see if that's something you're eligible for. Yeah, yeah. so really good question there. People on allowance, this would be someone who's living with uh, someone who is uh, 65 or over, a spouse, um, but they're, they're not pension age yet, so they're age 60 to 64. But if you're living with someone who's getting OAS after age 65, you can get the, what's called the allowance. So um, that's a very good question. Um, Shona is asking, it seems university are going online, but few colleges have made any announcements uh, for the fall. Um, as how, why is that? Boy, I tell you, Shauna, I really don't know that one. I, I think that would be a question, obviously, for the colleges. I think every, I am certain that every one of these post-secondary uh, institutions, colleges and universities are figuring out how they're going to go forward. Many of them, of course, have canceled convocations and had to do some kind of modified finish to the spring 2020 term. But as they go into the fall, I mean, they're they're going to want to have enrollment. Like they're they're really going to have to have something going. If, and it's unlikely that they're going to be back in traditional classroom situations. So here again, online learning is going to be probably a big facet there. But I would I'd recommend contacting the colleges directly. Um, and do uh, do I think that they will take all post secondary online, um, and perhaps get a break on tuition. Um, it's too early to tell on that one. I, I'm, I gonna have to say I, I'm doubtful. I guess maybe I'm too skeptical. <laughs> it's possible, you know. We, like other parents, I mean, we've we've had our kids go through a post-secondary school as well, and and paid for tuition in the same way everyone else does. And you do your best, and the kids do a little bit of work and try to contribute as well. But it's not inexpensive, and uh, a little bit of help uh, would would certainly be uh, conceivable there. But um, great, uh, great questions to follow up on, Shona, and thank you for raising them because that's certainly going to be on the minds of students. Uh, students who I hope, if they're not able to work, have made uh, access to the the emergency student benefit, which opened up last Friday. So hopefully that's helping out. Um, the question here, Gail is asking, any talk on easing the restrictions on the border to allow loved ones to come into Canada from the US? Um, so Gail's on a key point here, there is um, no uh, non-essential travel, uh, or put another way, uh, only essential travel is allowed across the border into the US. So that's for supply lines and shipments to keep the economy going uh, in even in the state that it's in to keep goods coming across the border uh, so that our grocery stores and other shelves are stocked and we're getting pharmaceuticals and all those things but if you don't fit into that essential category um, it's um, it's going to be tough to get across the border if you if you come up against a 
uh, a tough situation. I'm thinking possibly of you know the death in the family, a critical situation that would require cross-border travel. Get in touch with us. Uh, we'd be happy to uh, make sure we, uh, in fact, the Minister of Public Safety who uh, manages the, um, the the Canada Border Services Agency, CBSA, uh, has said that get those inquiries coming. Um, the decision lands with the actual border agent at the time you go across the border, um, but reason has to prevail here as well. So if it's a compelling situation, um, there, there will be a, some allowances made, but just for routine visits, this is off uh, until at least sometime after June 21st. There'll be no easing up on that. Um, but uh, again, get in touch with us and we'd be happy to see if we can get you some more specifics on that, Gail. So I think that's about all for uh, questions, Curtis. Do we have any? I think that's our last one, at least on the list. Yep, that's everything okay. we have. Great. Well, let's just go back uh, briefly to um, just to sort of wrap up here. And again, I, I want to thank everybody for uh, for tuning in tonight and for uh, putting some excellent questions up. By the time we get to next week, uh, I'm sure that there'll be some other news to report. I just wanted to um, uh, mention that the uh, as we get closer to June 1st, we've got a tax deadline looming. You will know, remember that the old April 30th date is no longer and it's now gonna be June 1st. So that's a week Monday. Uh, June 1st lands on a Monday. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, we're just coming into the weekend. A week from next Monday is your tax uh, filing deadline. Uh, I mentioned earlier at the, uh, at the start of the program, there's a few other issues that we're hearing from, from constituents across the riding, and I don't want to get into the details of them now, but suffice to say that because of the limits on gatherings, we anticipate uh, doing some uh, specific Facebook uh, live town halls on uh, one of them being on the issue of the recent uh, prohibition on firearms that was um, uh, announced on the 1st of May. Uh, that's an issue that we've been hearing a lot about, especially for, you can imagine here in Simcoe North, there's a lot of uh, avid uh, firearm uh, users, uh, sports shooters, uh, hunters. These are use of firearms in the legal uh, realm are part of their lives. and. This prohibition has uh, caused some concerns and, and uncertainty. Um, all of it, of course, in the midst of making sure we're doing all we can to uh, allow, on one hand, civilians uh, to use firearms in a, in a regulated and, and uh, a regime that protects public safety, and at the same time, making sure that firearms that are used in a criminal sense or used to to, to you know, incur the kind of risk and menace that they can be if they're illegal uh, and used by the criminal elements uh, or even people who are, you know, for whatever reason are um, unable or, or perhaps uh, have gotten to a point of, of stress or anxiety that act out in ways that uh, put firearms in their hands as we saw in this uh, terrible tragedy down in Nova Scotia just a few weeks ago. Very hard. One can't can't explain those situations, but this is where you know we can see that restrictions and rules around firearms access have to be in place, and we have to be doing all of our uh, everything we can do to keep firearms out of the hands of people who might end up harming people in their community. So uh, that's a that's a big issue. Um, the other one is, is and I think we've even talked about this on a previous show, um, the issue of broadband uh, internet access. Uh, we're seeing, of course, some real gaps, especially in rural parts of Canada, um, including in our riding. There's gaps of uh, people who do not have access to internet services. So essential at a time like this, where it is your a, a lifeline, re really, uh, in reality, a lifeline to make sure that you can stay connected to the services you need. So uh, our party is actually launching a consultation on this uh, to to get so we've we've advanced some ideas ideas on how to improve a rural internet access. So we're going to be out over the next couple of months and perhaps over the summer uh, in the community talking about how we can uh, get this right. Um, and thirdly, just on another issue, we 
starting on Monday, uh, you're going to see a, a debate about what Parliament does next. Um, the, the the House, uh, by by order of, uh, of the House, uh, a motion that was passed on the 20th of April, the House will come back and reconvene on Monday, the 25th. It, not in not all members, just a small, probably a group of about 50 MPs in proportion to the parties that are in the House. And they'll be deciding what comes next uh, in terms of the parliamentary sittings, whether we do a some kind of a hybrid um, sittings in Parliament, as well as people joining by video conference. Uh, so the parties in their midst of discussing that now. <clears throat> so that's on tap. And um, just to stay, just to remember that we, uh, we're working hard for you in our offices each and every day. Uh, we're open 9 to 4.30. We, uh, we're using Zoom <laughs> ourselves to <clears throat> stay connected and uh, and be informed on the important programs that we're doing. Uh, <clears throat> I want to thank our director tonight, David Dalrymple, and uh, my executive assistant, Curtis. <coughs> excuse me, my voice is going here now, um, for coming in tonight and, and doing our program. And I also want to end with a great, a big thank you to all of our frontline workers who are doing an amazing job to keep us all healthy and safe and stocked and they're at the curbside to give us the goods that we need. So I want to thank you all. I, I'm going to be in Ottawa next week, uh, possibly. We'll wait and see, depending on what happens on Monday. Um, but I will uh, be happy to be back here. We're, we've scheduled our broadcast for a Thursday evening next week. And we'll have that all ready to go for you and all of the new updates that you could look forward to learning about um, the next uh, the next wave, I could say. I probably shouldn't even use the word wave, but the next, uh, the time ahead that will show us uh, what we're needing to be mindful of as we all kind of track this path uh, through this uh, very unusual uh, health emergency. So have a good night, uh, stay well, and stay in touch. We'll see you next time. Thank you very much.